And in this video, I am going to share with you just some interesting statistics from my conversations with Americans already living in Portugal, where they share with us the things they think people need to know before they make the decision to move to Portugal. My name is Alana and I work for Magronis. We are a global citizenship and residency by investment company. The first decision one has to make is about your visa. Now, Americans are in this fortunate position that your citizenship and your passport allows you the opportunity to visit Portugal on a tourist visa for three months at a time. If, however, you decide you really like the country and you want to stay a little bit longer, you need a different type of visa. So the most popular visas for investors are either the D7 or the Golden Visa. And the main difference between those two is that the Golden Visa requires an investment in Portugal, either in real estate or in a private equity fund, and it allows you to only spend seven days a year in Portugal. If you decide to follow the D7 route, you are not required to make an investment in Portugal, but then you have a significant stay requirement in Portugal. You are not allowed to spend more than six months out of the country in the next two years in order to have your visa renewed. So let's have a look at those two visas specifically in a little bit more detail. We can start with the golden visa, where your underlying investment is the first decision you have to take. So you have opportunities in the real estate side to invest from 280,000 euros all the way through to 500,000 euros. And that depends on the area, the municipality and the type of investment you want to make. If you choose to invest in the fund market, which is a very popular market for investors, I think Americans are quite familiar with that category of investing, you have to invest 500,000 euros. For the golden visa, as I said, you only need to spend seven days per year in Portugal. And that makes it very attractive for people that don't want to move to Portugal immediately or don't want to spend more than maybe two or three months of the year in Portugal. The D7, on the other hand, allows you to relocate to Portugal without initially making a real estate investment. You do have to prove, though, that you have a minimum sustainable income of $8,460 or euros coming from outside of Portugal. You do need a tax number. You do need a bank account in Portugal. You have to prove that you have health insurance to the value of 30,000 euros and you have to apply for this visa before you come to Portugal. So you have to apply at a local embassy in the USA. First decision you have to make when you decide to spend more time in Portugal is which of these two visas works best for you. So if you have a look at the link in the video below, there's significantly more categories that you can qualify for and I'll specify some of those details for you below. So let's talk a little bit about the documentary requirements if you want to apply for either of these visas. Um, in all cases, you need a NIF, which is a tax number, and a bank account before you can move to Portugal. So the NIF we affectionately refer to as the keys to the doors of Portugal because you literally cannot do anything in Portugal without first obtaining that tax number. So you can apply for it remotely, so you don't need to actually visit Portugal to get that NIF, and it is, it is useful to actually get that in place before you arrive. You cannot open a bank account without having a NIF. So your next step should then naturally be to open your bank account. This can also be done remotely, but for American investors, it's specifically important to make the visa decision before you open your bank account, because there are some banks in Portugal that will not allow US investors, for instance, to make a fund investment out of that, uh, out of that investment account or bank account that they open. So you need to make those decisions before you come. So a consultation with a, with a tax professional or an immigration professional is probably a good idea before you make those decisions. The next conversation we have to have is about tax. And I think tax for everybody is quite an important decision when you make an investment in any country or in any product. In Portugal, there's a specifically interesting tax regime called the NHR or the Non-Habitual Tax Regime. And this was created in 2009 to specifically attract expats to come and live in Portugal and move their tax affairs to Portugal. Americans, of course, have a unique tax system, so it's always advisable that you get personal tax advice before you make that decision. If we think a bit about how the NHR works and what the potential benefits are, um, it was created to reduce people's tax on their pensionable income. So in an American case, your tax, for instance, or your income that's generated by your 401k plan uh, or any share portfolio investments or any rental portfolio investments, those are all considered fixed investments and you can get a tax break on those when you move to Portugal. You also have categories in the employment uh, sector as well as entrepreneurial sector where people can qualify for NHR. 
I've made a separate video about NHR specifically, and I'll share it in the link below. You're welcome to have a look at that. But remember that Facebook is not a good place to get tax advice. Please go and see a tax advisor and make sure that you get these facts right before you move to Portugal. One of the biggest challenges people have, and this is not just Americans, but people from all over the world, when you come from a fast-paced society, trying to do anything in Portugal is very slow. So people talk about the bureaucracy. And what does that mean? It just means that there's rules and regulations for everything and it doesn't always make sense. So it takes a very long time to get things done. So it often is advisable to actually just find a consultant uh, or a professional that can help you with these services. Unless, of course, you're one of those unique people that actually love to do your own admin and struggle with the bureaucracy. So our next topic is very important for a lot of people, regardless of your age healthcare and health insurance. Uh, we all know that healthcare and health insurance is very expensive in the USA um, and that at the moment the US only ranks 37th in the world in terms of healthcare uh, providers. On the other hand, in Portugal, the quality of healthcare is ranked at 12th in the world. So an interesting statistic to take note of. Specifically, if we look at the, at the cost of health insurance, in the USA, you would typically pay for a 50-year-old person between $1,200 and $1,400 per month for good quality health care. The same policy from a similar quality insurance company in Portugal will only cost you $1,200 to $1,400 euros per annum. So literally a fraction of the price. So the cost of health care is significantly lower. The quality of the health care in Portugal is also surprisingly good. So on a personal note, it's interesting to see the statistics, but when you actually live here and you require health care services, you understand that for the first time. One of our friends recently had a health scare and instead of going to hospital, he had a Zoom call with an English speaking doctor who then admitted him to hospital ordered various tests, stress tests, uh, blood pressure tests, an ECG, um, and, and he paid a very small amount for this ECG. I think it was uh, $30. In comparison to a ECG in the US with health insurance costing you between $200 and $300. And if you don't have any health insurance, it can cost you up to $3,000. So if you just compare the price, it's significantly cheaper to have good quality health care in Portugal. If we think a little bit about um, the rest of the family, because of course it's not only humans that relocate, but our pets as well, um, even veterinary services are significantly cheaper in Portugal than it is uh, in the USA. So here a typical veterinary appointment will cost you $20 or 20 euros um, rather than, uh, than, than the significantly higher costs in the USA. So if we, if we think about our pets, uh, because that's an important part of the family, right? Um, we, we all want to bring our pets with us. Um, it's quite expensive to relocate your pet. Um, and I think when you, when you start looking at that, you also have to look at where you're going to want to live because the rules in Portugal, once again, the bureaucracy word comes back, is very interesting. You are technically allowed to bring five of any category of animal or type of animal per person. So you can bring five cats and you can bring five dogs, that is legally allowed. But most municipalities in urban areas will only allow four pets per household. So if you're moving to a farm in the Algarve, then you can bring all the pets. If you're moving to a house or an apartment in one of the towns, then you can only bring four of your pets with you. So in terms of pet relocation, there's a whole list of companies that provide relocation services. And I'll add that link for you uh, in the video below so you can go and research that. But you should typically plan your pet relocation more or less at the same time as you start planning your own because your pets have to be older than seven months, they have to be vaccinated for rabies, there's all sorts of certificates that has to be in place, um, and it's really quite a torturous, uh, torturous process and journey for your animals. So there are companies that can help you with that. Uh, very interesting, there's a Facebook page available, I'll add the link for you in the video below as well, um, that specifically focuses on relocating families together with their pets. So you can charter a private plan with a few other families, and mom, dad, the kids, and all the pets can come on the same flight and arrive in Portugal in comfort. So that's quite a nice service to have. The next question we often get asked is whether people should rent or whether they should make an investment or buy. And I think the important thing here is to actually separate in your mind your investment decision to qualify, for instance, for your golden visa from where you ultimately want to live. So if you're making a golden visa investment, there's certain categories that you can invest in to qualify for your golden visa. But that's not typically an investment or a property that you can live in. It's typically a resort hotel development or a small apartment that is not really suitable for family living. 
So our advice normally is for people to make the golden visa investment to qualify to get the right to relocate and then move to Portugal and rent in a few different places. If you don't know the country that well, just like anywhere else in the world you move to, it makes some sense to rent a little bit. Spend some time in the north in the Algarve, spend some time in Lisbon if you like the pace. Come to Cascais where I live, which is a beautiful coastal town. Spend a bit of time and get to know the area. The Algarve is very popular because there's a lot of English speaking people there, but you might be moving with a family, which means you also have to look at different schools. Um, so you have to do that investigation and then decide where you want to invest in your future family home. So separate those two decisions and then you'll be in a much more comfortable position uh, and not under pressure to, to make this decision too quickly. If we look at what's available when you, when you rent, it's quite interesting. I recently went on a trip to specifically go and investigate what you can get because we, we tend to be a little bit spoiled in the West America as well as South Africa where I'm from. We're used to a lot of space. So the family home is typically not a small two bedroom apartment. It's a much bigger space with gardens and patios and pools and barbecue spaces, etc. And it's very hard to find those type of properties in the city. And if you do find them, they're quite expensive. Uh, so so um, in a place like Estrella, for instance, which is a beautiful neighborhood in Lisbon, um, you can easily pay 5,000 euros per month for a three bedroom, 200 square meter apartment. If you want to make an investment and buy that property, it could cost you up to 4 million euros. Uh, there are some lower cost options available when you move a little bit into the interior or if you go to Porto or Braga, a beautiful city like Guimarães, for instance, where you can buy a much bigger property uh, for about a million euros, you can get a five bedroom property. Um, if you go further south to the Algarve, there's some areas all the way down the southwest side of the coast in Lagos. I specifically went and had a look there. It's a beautiful little sailing community. And there's some beautiful properties available there, um, but they're very hard to find. So although I say available, um, the demand is very high. So it's quite hard to get, uh, to get a good property. One really has to be able to spend the time to do the research. Uh, so I've done a comparison for you. This is uh, just a comparison based on my experience and where I've been and what I've had a look at. And I'll add the link for you below so you can get a feel for what the, the cost per square meter uh, and the rental cost of a similar property is. One of the most hotly debated topics at the moment, both in person, in conversation and on Facebook groups, is whether to bring your own goods to Portugal or whether to shop locally. One of my friends, American lady that lived in Seattle, recently told me that when she moved here in April, she got a quote for $7,000 for a 20 foot container and thought that that was, you know, reasonable. She's relocated and lives here and wants her stuff. A month later, she got a quote again for exactly the same container and the price had increased to $13,000. And three weeks after that, exactly the same quote was $26,000. So the price has increased significantly and at the moment that might be a bit unusual because of the logistics crunch, but it is very expensive to, to ship your goods. Another US family told me that they actually had an inspection when their goods left the US in Long Beach and their inspection cost them 10,500 US dollars, which is a lot of money to spend um, if you weren't even aware of that. Um, on a more personal note, when I moved here from South Africa, uh, I went on the same uh, uh, expedition looking around for who would move my goods. And one of the companies I spoke to actually asked me specifically, how do you feel about IKEA? And for a moment, I didn't really understand what they were talking about. And the lady said to me, look, it's going to cost you more to ship these few things than it will cost you to just furnish your whole house out of IKEA. Um, so it is an interesting debate and you have to do the homework. Um, incidentally, I found a company that shipped it for a lot less and I will have my personal goods here pretty soon. One of the things one's always concerned about when you move to a country where they speak a foreign language um, is whether you will be helped in your own language if there is services available in English. There's, there's no good at being a good healthcare service and you can't access it or understand it. Uh, but in Portugal, most of the big hospitals actually have English speaking dedicated desks. There's a lot of uh, English speaking doctors, dentists on staff, the pharmacies uh, all have a choice of either Portuguese or English. Uh, when I just moved here, uh, I arrived with uh, laryngitis, so I actually had no voice and I spoke no Portuguese, which was quite a challenge. Um, so I thought I was very clever. I left the hospital or the, I left my hotel with a face mask on and my iPad in hand and I'd done the Google Translate thing to describe my symptoms, have no, no voice, sore throat, coughing, etc. Translated it all in Portuguese and walked into the pharmacy with my iPad up like this only for a very friendly American voice to actually speak to me and said, it's okay, dear, I speak English, I can help you. So there's a lot of English spoken in the medical facilities uh, in, in this country. Uh, so you will be taken well care of. 
So another interesting topic is cars, driving, licenses, etc. How do you get around? Although there's a fantastic infrastructure and the trains and the buses and the taxis and the Ubers are good, most of us ultimately would like to have our own car and drive around when it suits us. So people do drive on the, on the right-hand side of the road here, which is very nice because it's the same as in the US. So that's one less hurdle for you to overcome. Um, cars typically though are um, stick shift um, and I understand from my American friends many of them got their licenses 20 or 30 years ago only driving automatic cars so it takes a little bit of getting used to um, if you're not uh, if you're not used to driving a stick shift car it's also harder to rent an automatic car because those are the first ones that uh, that get rented out um, in terms of your license you are able to transfer your US license and get a Portuguese driver's license. You have to do that within the first year after receiving your residency, your residency card. And they will physically take your driver's license from you, issue you a Portuguese license, and then post your driver's license back to your home address uh, in the US. Uh, which is an interesting little logistics uh, process they follow. There's a few interesting things that happens here. There's, there's a lot of roundabouts and some of my friends are struggling with the roundabouts. And maybe when you swap around from the left side to the right side, uh, you're not always sure how to approach the roundabout. So it's just something that one, has to, that one has to get used to, take it slowly in the beginning. There's also random traffic lights or they seem, they seem random to you at first and people start looking for traffic crossings. But these are actually traffic calming measures. So there's traffic uh, cameras everywhere. And if you're caught speeding along a certain piece of road, a, right, a red light will just go up to slow you down and you stop for a second or two and then you can go on. So if you're not aware of these and you don't think that it's going to be there, it's quite easy to just blow through this light and then of course you get fined. Um, and they're quite good at issuing those fines and tracking you down so you have to pay them. Uh, so there's some interesting things that one has to think about uh, in terms of the driving around. I'm absolutely amazed at how many of my American friends comment on two things, the quality of the air and the quality of the food in Portugal. Now the quality of the air, there's a lot of statistics available about how beautiful and fresh and clean it is. And for me living on the coast here in Cascais, I can certainly feel that every day when the ocean breeze comes in and washes away the day's troubles. So the quality of air here is important and maybe that contributes to the quality of food. But there certainly is a huge amount of fresh food and produce available. So Portugal is an agricultural country and uh, produces a lot of the fruit and the vegetables that you buy in the markets. There's a lot of fresh meat available. Um, it's also an ocean country, so there's a, a lot of uh, beautiful fresh uh, seafood available. Um, I think one of the things that's maybe a little bit different other than the quality of food is that the portions of food that are served here uh, is smaller, uh, the packaging is smaller, there are some products that is missing for instance, as some of my American friends complain, or well, not complain, they are concerned about the fact that they have never bumped into a coffee creamer. Uh, I know in the States you have shelves and shelves of different types of coffee creamer, um, but I think if you walk into a cafe here and ask for coffee creamer on top of your abatonado, that might not be so, uh, so popular. Um, but it is interesting that we miss certain products from, from home. Uh, there's also a very good wine industry in Portugal, so maybe a good way to, uh, to end our video is to talk a little bit about the wine that's available. In the last few years, the industry has improved tremendously in terms of global reputation. And certainly I've never heard anybody complain about, uh, about the wine in Portugal. Uh, large quantities of it is consumed on a daily basis. And maybe if you're missing a little bit of the, the, the portions and the sugary nature of your food back home, instead of having a glass of wine, you can switch to a beautiful jug of sangria that comes with lots of sugar in it. And it certainly makes for a festive evening. If you enjoyed this video and you like the information that I share, please subscribe to the channel and like the video. Add your comments below and ask some questions if you like. The feedback is valuable to us. And if you'd like to ask me some personal questions, my WhatsApp number is in the, in the text below. I look forward to hearing from you and see you next time. Ciao.